Welcome to today's webinar titled Writing a Case Report, Introduction and Discussion Sections, Making Your Case with Ruth Warner and Gerilyn Cameron. This is the second webinar in a series of five that we're doing with the Massage Therapy Foundation on writing case reports. We did that first one last week, as I mentioned, and we recorded that. We at ABMP are super excited about this series and hoping that you'll um, you know, embrace the idea of writing a case report yourself, right? trying to demystify the whole process for you. Now I'm going to introduce Gerilyn who's narrating the series and then she's going to introduce Ruth. Gerilyn is a professor in the Department of Research at the National University of Health Sciences and her focus is on complementary and alternative medicine, that's CAM, and also evidence-based practice. She's been involved in CAM research for 25 years and has published extensively in scientific literature. Gerilyn is currently the president-elect of the Massage Therapy Foundation Welcome, Gerilyn. Hi, Brian. How are you? Um, we're Hi. so excited to be here once again today, and the Massage Therapy Foundation would again like to thank ABMP for this opportunity. Uh, last week, we had uh, the first presentation of the series, and this presentation covered kind of the basics of what is a case report, and how do you start one, and how do you choose uh, a case to report on. Uh, where you publish this type of case report, and so just some of the basics. Um, and before we move along, I, I, first of all, I want to say that, as Brian said, this is going to be archived. The first one has been archived already, and the subsequent sessions are also going to be archived. But let's just do a very quick poll initially to see how many of you were here last time so we can kind of gauge um, who's, who's continuing with us and perhaps who's coming on as a, a new uh, person. So Brian, if you could do that poll. Okay, so I've launched it. It's very easy. You choose yes or no. And we'll wait for a few more of you to submit your answers. Okay, great. I'm going to go ahead and close it. We've got 75%, actually 78. 52 said yes. 48% said no. So even Stephen. Well, that's exciting. Okay, great. Well, welcome those of you who um, are just joining us for the first time and for those who are continuing, we thank you for uh, continuing with us. Today we have Ruth Warner talking and this is an exciting one. Uh, she's going to be talking about introduction and discussion sections. These are two different sections of a, an official scientific case report and so she's going to talk about what exactly should go in these different sections. Uh, what should you include and, and what shouldn't you include. But just to introduce Ruth uh, for a moment here, um, Ruth is the current president of the Massage Therapy Foundation and she has been on the case report contest uh, that the foundation holds since 19, or, <laughs> 19, since 2007. So she's looked at many, many case reports that have been submitted and she knows the ins and outs of what types of mistakes most people make when they're first writing case reports. And so that's what she's going to be talking about today. So thank you, Ruth, for being here today and presenting this topic. Great. Thanks for having me, Gerilyn. Of course, we get to work together a lot. Gerilyn and I are, are like connected at the hip, but only through phone lines. Um, I just want to check in with my partners uh, that the sound level is okay. Very good. Thank you. Hearing, hearing no problems, I'm going to move on. Good, so welcome everybody. I'm really glad that you're here um, because I love to talk about case reports. Um, in my view, case reports are a form of citizen science. They are a way every single massage therapist who's in practice can um, legitimately and credibly share their findings with their peers. And you know, as you, as you know, one of the things that's that's unique and 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 truly beautiful about massage is its is its sense of privacy and its sense of um, sometimes I call it the sacred bubble, right, that we create between ourselves and our clients. Um, but there are times when it's appropriate to share what happens in those session rooms so that other massage therapists don't have to be constantly reinventing the wheel. And of course, there are many other benefits to writing case reports that, that Gerilyn began talking about last week in the way that they contribute to our, our evidence pyramid and the way that, um, that that builds to help our whole profession become 
better recognized and better understood um, uh, among not only our clients and, and the consumers of massage, but also um, the other people in our world, doctors, physical therapists, um, uh, uh, and other uh, healthcare providers who, who need to understand more about what massage does and how it can work. Um, and the cool thing about case reports, of course, is that everybody listening to this webinar, if you're a massage therapist, you have um, the skills that it takes to do this. It's not, it's not simple and it's not fast, but it is within your skill set and I would say within your job description to be able to write a good case report um, because that's the only way that our profession is going to grow um, is, when we, is, is by us sharing this with each other. So case reports, um, like other research articles, have specific sections in them. Um, and today I'm going to talk about two of those sections, the introduction and the discussion. Interestingly, those two sections um, are separated by what comes in the middle, which is the actual um, case where the sessions happen and the results are reported. Um, but because these two are sort of more thought-based rather than hands-based, we put them together into this one webinar. So we'll talk first about the introduction. Um, in the world of case reports, what the introduction says is why this is important. Um, it, it is building the case for why reading about massage in the context of back pain, massage in the context of diabetes, massage in the context of insomnia, you know, why these things um, are worth your time to read. And so within the introduction, these arguments will come up. This situation is significant. It affects a lot of people or it affects a, a special population but in a very extreme kind of way. Also in the introduction we, we present this material in a way that it is clear that we are not making stuff up. And, and really what I'm referring to there is the literature review um, which we'll be spending um, a fair amount of time on uh, just in this webinar. Um, and then a, a, a further, a very important point that needs to be made in the introduction is how what came before can be used so that our clients can get better results. Um, in other words, I'm a massage therapist, I have this many years of experience, and I know from my experience and from the reading that I've done on it, that these kinds of techniques are going to be better for fibromyalgia than some others. Um, and here's how I'm going to demonstrate that, that knowledge. Right? So um, these are the main things that have to appear in an introduction. That the situation is significant, that, it, that you're pulling together information based on credible sources, and that you're using those credible sources and that information um, to, to build upon uh, uh, and, and make a better treatment um, for your client, if that's possible. Um, and I've included this plea, uh, this is from, from people who read a lot of case reports, that, that the first paragraph in your introduction is really the one that's going to determine whether your audience is going to read it or not. So you want to use your first paragraph in your, in, in your introduction really to grab attention. So one of the key parts of what happens in, in the introduction is the literature review. And last week, Geraldine talked to a certain extent about um, prospective studies versus retrospective studies. So a prospective study, just to review, means that you decide before you ever put your hands on this client, you decide, oh, what a great idea, I'm going to do a case report with this client. And that would allow you to do your background reading and your research and, your research and make some choices about your session design you know, before you even begin. Um, what happens for a lot of people in massage and in, and in the other health sciences uh, is that it turns out that a retrospective study um, is, is, is a good um, topic for a case report, but in order to do a good retrospective study, it means we are assuming that you built your treatment strategy on these three things. Your expertise as a provider of care, your client's priorities and values, um, and, and this is where massage therapists often fall short, and what the research says. Um, and that those three things together create um, an effective strategy. 
when we combine these three things together, I'm going off on a tiny little tangent, but it's, it's a concept I really am invested in having every massage therapist understand. When we combine these three things, your expertise, your education, your years of experience, plus your client's priorities and values and, and their, their, your, your client's goals, and what the research says, when we combine all three of those together, we have what is called evidence-informed practice. And this allows us to create a po the possibility of the best possible outcomes. And we call this best practices. Um, so let's go back to our introduction. When we are starting to think about writing an introduction to a case report, here are the three main things that must happen. The first thing is we need to settle on a research question. And then we need to do a lit review pertinent to that research question. And then we need to actually write the introduction. And so for a little while, we're going to talk about these three steps. And the first one, of course, is writing the research question. And it is always surprising to me when I, when I do workshops on this, um, how hard it is to write a really good research question. And so last week, Gerilyn began this process, and one of her polls was, um, you know, do you have some ideas about a client with whom you'd like to do a case report? And a lot of people said yes, which was really exciting. Um, if, if you're listening today and you have some ideas about people that you'd like to do a case report with, um, here is one of the first things you need to do. You need to figure out what question you're going to ask. And here are some things that you need to consider that. Is it a yes or no question? For instance, does massage make a difference for perceived fatigue for someone who has MS? That's a case report that I actually have read and we'll talk about it. It'll, it'll come up as an example um, as we go through today. So it might be an, a, a yes or no question. Does massage make a difference? Or does massage improve grip strength for someone who has carpal tunnel syndrome? Or these are yes or no questions. Alternatively, one could ask an open-ended question like, what are the effects of massage for someone who has multiple sclerosis? So in that situation, you might choose to measure several different things, like fatigue or pain or numbness or uh, sleep or, you know, what have you. You can, you can decide what things it is that you're going to track if you're going to ask an open-ended question about whether massage is effective in a particular situation. Which, of course, leads us to, does it have multiple possible answers? Those answers might be, you know, it was great for, um, it, was, it was great for pain and numbness and quality of life, but it didn't seem to make a big difference about fatigue or sleep. Um, those are examples of, of, of multiple possible answers. Um, and perhaps the most important thing that you need to consider when you're writing your research question is, is this a question that is applicable for a case report? In other words, can it be answered with an N, that means number of participants, with an N of one? Um, sometimes we'll get case report um, submissions to our contest at the foundation where the research question is something like, will massage prevent strokes for someone who's elderly? Well, that's problematic because you can't answer a question like that with an N of 1. It would be incredible. In fact, asking for prevention, asking prevention questions is a very, very difficult question to ask. And it would need to be done among a huge population group over a prolonged period of time. Um, and so uh, it's, a case report is not a great place to start for a question like that. Um, you know, a more applicable question if you have a client who's at risk for stroke is, um, oh, let's see, what might be a more applicable question if your client is at risk for stroke? Um, you know, you might look instead for, will massage have an effect on blood pressure? Um, which is, you know, a leading risk factor for stroke. So these are some... Um, challenges around writing a research question. So we're going to do our first poll, which actually um, Gerilyn asked last week, but we have, you know, at least some of you are a different group with us today. And so, um, Brian, I'm going to give this to you, and I'm going to mute myself while you... While you do that. <coughs> okay, great. So the poll question, have you ever read a published case report? <coughs> Excuse me. 
So answer yes or no, and then we'll share the results. Okay, great. I'm going to go ahead and close that. We've got 68% uh, people voting. And Ruth, I know you can hear me, 65% said yes, they have read a published case report, and 35% said no. And then she's trying to unmute herself, and there's a few second delay. So go ahead and unmute. Yeah, there we go. Just trying, tr clicking wildly to unmute myself. Okay, great. Well, that's that's wonderful. So about two thirds of you are, you know, have seen case reports. They come in various levels of complexity and um, and ambition and and uh, uh, um, value. Um, but we can learn something even from poorly done case reports. There are things to learn there. So I, um, I encourage you to look for these, and we'll talk more about where you can find them later. So the next thing we're going to talk about then is um, steps in putting together your literature review. Um, so for many of you listening to this, you may be already be familiar with some of these resources and some of these terms. But for those of you who are not, I want to review this. Um, uh, and, and particularly, I want to talk about primary and secondary resources. Um, so primary resources are articles that were written by the people who did the research. And the advantage to reading primary articles or primary resources is that these are um, written for a scientific group. They are, they are intended to be as free from judgment and bias as it is possible for a human being to be. Um, and while, of course, every researcher is going to interpret and discuss their findings in a certain way, um, the data is there for people to draw their own conclusions. By contrast, secondary resources are usually commentary on primary resources. In other words, they come through another filter of someone's perception or bias or point of view. Um, on the other hand, secondary resources are often written by professional writers. Um, and scientists, sadly, I have to say, most scientists are not professional writers, and consequently reading their material can be a harder slog. Um, and so secondary resources can be friendlier for people who are unfamiliar with scientific language to use, but we have to be aware that they are not as strong to, to build our case as the primary resources. Um, so for instance, when I'm reading case report entries in our contest and people are listing um, my book and other um, uh, textbooks in their bibliography as their, you know, as their main sources of information, well, I, you know, I think it's really flattering when people use my book as a source of information, but it is not a primary resource by any stretch of the imagination. And, um, and what that shows is that that case report writer really needed to go back and find some primary resources to bolster their arguments. So where do we find these? Geraldine introduced this last week. Um, PubMed.gov is the world's largest database of academic peer-reviewed sci uh, scientific journals. Scholar, Google Scholar, which can be found at scholar.google.com. Um, weeds through the majority of advertisements masked as good information, but not all of the resources you'll find there are primary. Um, I think a really good place to look for resources is in the bibliographies of the articles that you find that you like. Uh, and, you know, Wikipedia is a standby. Wikipedia is a great place to start when you're gathering information, but please be, be aware it is not a primary resource. And so while it can get you started, um, good Wikipedia entries have a bibliography. And so your job then is to pursue those other, uh, those, those other sources of information. Um, and I just wanted to put a quick plug in here for the Massage Therapy Foundation's Education Toolbar. This is a free download that we have on our website, um, which basically adds a toolbar to your browser that will give you, with, with a search box, that will give you instant access to PubMed, to Google Scholar, and to, um, I think, three or four other uh, really good quality databases so that you can um, uh, be more efficient in your searches. So this is where we start to gather our resources. Now, 
in order to use PubMed or Google Scholar, um, you need to have good keywords. And this is where a lot of people get a little bit stuck. Um, and so, you know, for instance, if you were to go to um, PubMed and put in massage and heart disease, you would get an awful lot of articles about cardiac massage. That's CPR. And those are not going to probably help you. Probably they are not applicable to what you are looking for. And so you need to learn how to refine your keywords. Um, in working with people a lot over the years, I have come to the conclusion that it's, it, you know, that doing massage or massage therapy and fill in the blank is a good place to start. But sometimes you may be just as well off skipping the name of the condition and simply talking about the symptoms, for instance, massage and fatigue as opposed to massage and MS or massage and heart disease. Um, you might also want to look at um, other aspects around the condition or other, what other um, healthcare providers do in the context of that condition. So for instance, um, looking up uh, whatever, what research has been done on um, diabetes and glucose control um, and then weeding out for pharmacological interventions, then you might, you know, you might see if there are other interventions, non-drug interventions for diabetes uh, and, and blood glucose control that you might use to inform the research that you're doing. So keywords can be tricky, they can be challenging, and you need to be sometimes very imaginative about how you use them to find the literature that's going to be helpful for you. So you can go beyond the massage therapy literature and see what others have done to achieve similar goals. I have another great example for this. Um, I had someone, uh, this was right after the movie The King's Speech had come out, and she came to me and, and said, um, I would be really interested to do a case report on massage and stuttering because it seems to me that if we could reduce the tension in the neck, um, this might really improve a person's ability to speak freely and you know, without hesitation. And I thought, wow, what a great idea. And I went home and looked it up and there's nothing on massage and stuttering. Um, but what she will have to do if she's going to pursue this is look at you know, research for speech and language pathologists to see what they have around interventions for studying, especially for stuttering rather, um, especially for things like how do you measure effectiveness. Um, so sometimes we have to go outside our profession to see what others are doing and that's great. I really encourage us to do that. Now one of the um, obstructions that people may hit when they are uh, trying to put together their lit review is the paywall conundrum. Because until recently, uh, you know, we're, we're actually sort of riding the cusp of a big shift in, um, in, in uh, informational publishing right now. Um, and and the, the previous model was that journals would put out their articles, um, you know, maybe quarterly or, or a few times a year in hard copy and you'd pay something like $70 or $100 a year and get four issues. Um, and, you know, for the ones that might have a, a, an article about massage, there might, if you're lucky, be one or two articles a year that might be pertinent for massage in general. Um, nowadays, you can go online, find these articles, and they'll charge you, say, $30 to download it. Um, and that's how they meet their, you know, that pay, pay per view, if you like, model for accessing information. Um, this is problematic if you need 10 articles on your on your project, for instance, and they're all behind these paywalls. Um, and so you may want to investigate what your options are if you don't have that kind of that kind of money. I, I will share with you that I am a cheapskate and it, it has to be something really valuable for me to pay out that kind of money. So some of your options. If you run if you find an article that you like but you can't access it. Um, are to see if possibly your public library subscribes to the journal that where, where your article is found. Um, if you have a medical school near you, especially if it's a public medical school, then your taxes are paying for their library and so you should be able to access it there. Um, or you might want to do a more general internet search and see if through some other venue um, the author has published this work. Um, I've also heard from some authors 
that they will sometimes be solicited by interested readers saying, you know, boy, because some, on, on PubMed, for instance, the contacting author will very often have a, an email where you can um, reach them to ask questions. Um, and some authors are, are generous about sharing their information that way. Um, so if you hit the paywall conundrum, you do have some alternatives, but they are somewhat limited. I will say again on a tiny tangent that this is finally beginning to shift and change and, and more and more journals are going to open access. Um, also, any um, study that was paid for with funds from the National Institutes of Health is now required to go to open access. In other words, you know, come out from behind the paywall um, a year after it's been published um, because essentially our tax dollars have already paid um, for that information. So, this, the paywall conundrum still definitely exists, but it's becoming less of a problem than it used to be for you to access this information. Now, this is the slide for which I must apologize. It's way too crowded. Um, there's much too much information on here. And so for your sanity, I really recommend that you take advantage of this service that ABMP offers um, and download this slide and just print it out. This comes from um, a lovely paper I found on, on how to do a good lit review without going absolutely insane. Um, and so what this person recommended is that as you are reading your articles, you collect relevant excerpts. And you can do this by cut and paste, you can do this by taking notes, you can do this in however you weigh, but here are the categories of relevant excerpts. Information about your client's situation. Description of the condition, including these things. Claims and conclusions about what interventions work or don't work, including whatever intervention you plan to use, if you can find any information about it. Definitions of terms, um, and for case report, for massage therapists, it's particularly important to define body work terms, because not everybody reads neuromuscular therapy the same way, or myofascial release the same way. So it can be useful to include some definitions of terms. Um, if you, in your reading you find calls for follow-up studies that seem to connect to your topic, that can be very important to have in, among your, in the information that you collect. Identify gaps in the information. And I'm begging you on my knees from someone who has made this mistake before, keep track of your references. So as you are collecting these excerpts, organize them in such a way so that you know where they came from. Uh, that will save you so much heartache later in your process. So what I'd like you to visualize is, is some different documents that you create or different pieces of paper that you create that have these excerpts on them and that, so that you can arrange them by theme if you like. Now before we leave this slide, I want to talk just for a second about these functional goals. Next week, Karen Boulanger is going to talk with you about your intervention and about you know, setting up your treatment strategies and, how, and, and what measures you're going to use and how to record those results. Um, there are clinical goals or clinical outcomes and there are functional outcomes. A clinical outcome might be something like the patient achieved full range of motion in knee extension. But a functional outcome is more like the client was able to climb stairs without pain. Can you see which one is going to be more important to the client? Um, in, in, at least I can, I can speak from the perspective of, of our case report contest um, and in manual therapies in general, um, there's increasing emphasis put on functional goals climbing stairs without pain, being able to walk to work if that's what someone needs to do, being able to um, fix dinner. Um, I'm a quilter and so I, you know, I love to sit at my sewing machine. That is physic can be physically very taxing and I know I have a friend who made it as a functional goal that the client was able to sew for an hour a day without pain. Um, these, these are, these really humanize the, the, the research that you're doing um, and they speak to serving the client. And if what we record doesn't somehow improve the quality of life for our client, then we're on the wrong track. So I do want to just really emphasize the importance 
of setting up some functional goals. And I'm sure Karen will talk about that more next week. So we're ready for another poll. And this is um, asking of people who, who go on to PubMed.gov um, and are familiar with it. Have you ever experienced research creep? And what that means is you start looking into one thing and then you find, ooh, that looks really interesting. And you go another way and then you go another way. And before you know it, you're so off topic, but you've learned a lot of really interesting things. So I'm going to go on mute and let Brian conduct this little poll. Okay, great. So go ahead and answer. We have yes or no. I'll leave it open for another three seconds. Have you ever experienced research creep on PubMed? Sounds like a good name for a band. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll, and I'm going to share the results. And Ruth, we had, let me make sure I have the right one. Yes, 65%, same exact split as last time. 65% said yes, 35% said no. Well, okay then. Um, if you have never played around on PubMed, you have a big treat waiting for you. You know, my kids hang around on YouTube and they just look up one thing after another because they, YouTube suggests things to them that they might like. Um, PubMed will do the same thing. Uh, and it can be a very, very fun way to spend some, you know, all of our free time that all of us have um, experiencing research creep. I encourage you to do that. It's really fun. Um, you know, simple pleasures for simple minds. So the third step, and now you've got your research question and you've gathered all of this information that you have organized into these themes, now it is time for the, for the ink to hit the paper um, or the fingers to hit the keyboard and to actually start writing. So you want to organize your excerpts into the themes according to how they connect to your project. And these are the, at least the very minimum that you, that you should probably plan on including definitions of terms, a description of the condition with all those things about pathophysiology and whatnot um, that, that was on the previous slide, describing the intervention that you choose and why, and the why is built on the reading that you've done, okay? Um, and then it is traditional and important to conclude your introduction with your objective. In other words, to conclude it with uh, a statement like, the goal of this case report is to see if massage therapy has an impact on, or you know, has an effect on, or improves this symptom of um, the condition or the situation um, that you're looking at. Um, and then that provides the lead into the next topic, which is, um, which is the, the client is the next topic in your case report. So that's traditional. You want to make sure that your research question is clearly stated in your concluding paragraph of your introduction. So all of this sounds really easy, right? It's, um, it, uh, to me, it can sound extremely um, intimidating. I think that writing the introduction in many ways is the hardest part of writing the case report. And so in that sense, once that's done, the rest of it's easy. Um, but here's some advice from someone who, has, who does a lot of technical writing. Um, you eat the elephant one bite at a time. You organize your thoughts and your themes and your excerpts so that as you write sentences, you can actually decide, does this go in this section of my introduction or does it really need to go in that section of my introduction? Um, it is always good to, you know, if you find a resource, say you find a, you stumble across a study that is um, relevant to your topic and you just think it's a really well-written study, that's wonderful. Use it as a model. Compare your organization to that scientist's organization. You can use models. We're allowed to do that. And of course, get help. Get help from your friends and your mentors. You're allowed to have one or two professional mentors for the practitioner case report contest and for the student case report contest it is assumed that you have a teacher mentor. These people can't write for you but they can certainly provide input. Um, they can copy edit. They can point out weaknesses. They can, um, you know, tell you that your research question isn't as clear as it might be. Um, please, by all means, use the people in your circle. Uh, you don't have to do this in a vacuum. You can do this in community. So it's time for another poll, which is what seems to you like the biggest obstacle in writing your introduction. 
Is it choosing a good research question? How do I know if it's a good one? Is it reading all the background material? It just seems too technical for me. Or is it the prospect of writing? Because writing is like pulling teeth. So Brian, I'm turning it over. Over to me. Okay, great. So go ahead and answer. Where is the, what's the biggest obstacle? Where's the writer's block? Is it choosing a research question, reading the background material, or writing, like pulling teeth? And I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. We had 61% uh, vote. Share the results. And Ruth, 44% get bogged down with choosing a research question. 19% get bogged down with reading the background material. And 37% say the biggest obstacle is writing, like pulling teeth. So she's unmuted. That is fascinating. That is so much not what I thought. I truly thought that reading the background material was going to be the most daunting, or, or writing were going to be the most daunting aspects of this. But it seems like the majority really um, uh, uh, struggle with the research question. And, um, and, uh, you know, and I'm kind of chuffed about that. I think that's pretty great. A research question is something you can definitely discuss with other people um, and talk it through to see what the strengths and weaknesses are of your research question. Um, it's actually much easier to do that than it is to, to get input on these two other things. So um, I encourage you to really use your community um, uh, to, uh, to pursue that. I'm just, Gerilyn, this is making me think we maybe need to do a webinar on writing a good research question. I just, I'm just really intrigued by that. I love it when you get an unexpected result. So we're going to move on now to talk about the discussion. And what we are skipping over is the part where you actually work with your client. So, so again, next week, um, Dr. Boulanger is going to chat with us about, um, about writing your client profile, about describing your methods and, and how much of that needs to go into the case report, um, and about reporting your results and choosing what goes in, what doesn't go in, what's pertinent and what's not. Um, so let's pretend we're already there. You've done your case report and you have, these, you have some data, and now you have to figure out what it means. That's what the discussion does. It says the results come in the previous section. The results is just, you know, um, the client was able to walk up two flights of stairs without paying, or the client found no changes in this or that. Um, those, the, you have your results. Um, and now it is your job to discuss what that means. That means to put your findings in a global context, in a larger context than just what happens between you and one person. Um, and that can be a little tricky. Um, and in the process of writing your discussion, you need to make sure that you are following a logical line from the research question to the intervention that you chose and defended to the data that you collected, to the conclusions that you draw from that data. I have read many case reports where the conclusions were not supported by the data or where the data was interesting, but it had nothing to do with the research question. Um, and so we want to make sure that you can trace a line all the way through from the question all the way through to your discussion or the conclusions that you draw um, from that question. And so now we'll talk about steps in writing the discussion. The first step, very important, simply restate your original objective or your original research question because it's been a little while since we've read it. And then you're going to state your major findings um, in a narrative form. And what it, the, the thing that I want you to remember or to realize is that negative findings or null findings, that means a, a null finding would, mean, would, would suggest that there's no difference nothing happened. Um, negative or null findings are also very informative. Um, we had an example, I keep coming, talking about fatigue and MS, and I, and I want to point this out because um, it was uh, something that we got in the case report contest, and she ended up being the winner. She was a woman who had a client with uh, multiple sclerosis, um, and the main complaint that this client had was fatigue. She had other minor complaints, or, or other complaints that were significant, but not her her functional goals, what she really wanted was to feel less fatigued. Um, 
and so this person um, did her background reading. She made a nice argument for the work that she did. Um, she did her sessions. She reported her results. And the result was that, in fact, no, this kind of massage made no difference for reported fatigue with this client who had multiple sclerosis. Um, and the, while we love it when we have positive findings, um, this report was done extremely well. She did everything that was within her power and her scope to reach out and find about what she, you know, what she wanted to do and her strategies. And she got a null finding and she reported it and, and she did it extremely well and she won the case report contest um, for that year. Now, you know, she was reporting on her version of massage, which she defended through the literature that she found. Um, our general feeling on the case report co contest committee is that there were some aspects about, about the massage intervention that she, you know, didn't know about or should have known about and didn't use. So we don't, you know, make a declarative, a declarative sentence that massage has no effect on, on MS and fatigue. Um, but we can say clearly that this type of massage did not affect fatigue for this client. Um, I, I just want us to be aware that not every um, outcome is going to be what we expect or what we hope for, but that doesn't mean that information isn't useful. And what it may do um, is prompt someone else to repeat that case report or to repeat that inquiry um, using a slightly different strategy to see if they get a different answer. Um, so don't be, don't worry about negative or null findings. Um, if that's you know part of if, if that's what happens, uh, it's definitely good to put them into your discussion and section. Um, it is the discussion section where you can talk about challenges or changes to your original treatment plan. This is completely legitimate, especially with a case report. You have an N of one. Um, I remember a case report once that was asking questions about massage and anxiety, and they were getting wonderful results. And then there was a sudden spike in the anxiety level charts. Um, and the, the therapist explained it, saying um, the client came to me that day on her way home from the dentist where she had just had a root canal done. Um, you know, obviously that's going to make a big change. When you have a large uh, participatory base, when you have an N of 1,000, um, those little glitches, they, they even themselves out and they sort of, and they disappear. But when you have only one participant and they have a bad day, um, it makes a big difference in whatever it is you may be recording. So those kinds of challenges or changes to the original treatment plan, completely legitimate, absolutely okay, um, but you need to report them, you need to explain them, and that's something that can go in the discussion. Um, and then we're going to explain your results. And as you explain your results, we also need to consider alternative explanations. And as I say this, I'm realizing that I, that I left out something I wanted to make an, a, a point of in an earlier slide. Um, and Geraldine used this term last week but didn't explain it. And it's something I needed to have someone explain to me, so I'm going to explain it to you. A lot of conditions have a, a, a predictable um, out, a prognosis, if you like. Okay. For instance, the prognosis for the common cold is that um, you will feel sick and run a low fever and have a lot of um, mucus production for you know maybe three or four days, and then you get better. Um, and that process is called the natural history, the natural history of a cold. Um, so if someone takes someone who has a cold and they give them their special secret recipe patented um, syrup, and that's the only thing that's added to the life of this person who has a cold, and they get better in three or four days, um, the person could try to make a claim that their special patented syrup cured this person's cold. Right? What they have left out of that discussion is that it is the natural history of a cold is that you're just going to get better in three or four days. So similarly, you know, when we're looking at our results, we want to make sure that what we're seeing is really what happened because of the massage and not what happened because of the natural history of the condition. You know, if your client has a sprained ankle and the natural history of a mild ankle sprain is that it will be swollen and painful for, I don't know, call it two weeks, and then this, the inflammation will subside and full range of motion will 
recur. Um, and then massage is added to it, but it doesn't change that natural history. We can't be, you know, you can't make an argument that massage really made the biggest difference for this. So we want to make sure that we're considering alternative, alternative explanations for results or that we are accounting for them as we explain what we think happened during this session uh, or during this series of massage therapy sessions. Um, we want to state why our findings are important and in order to do this we need to connect them to the research that you read um, as you were doing your lit review. How does your work fill in these gaps? How does it compare with what, with what other people found? If you found literature that said massage doesn't work for headaches, uh, but your case report seems to indicate that it definitely works for headaches, at least for this client, you know, it's worthwhile to say, um, I, I beg to differ with this previous finding because, um, you know, my client had a very different outcome and here's why I think it might have made a difference. Um, so this is where we're comparing our work to what has come before. And so at this point, I'd like to just take a quick poll. For those of you who have read case studies, if you've ever read one where the findings did not actually answer the research question. So I'm going on mute. Brian, it's over to Okay, great. Have you ever read a study where the findings did not answer the research question? So go ahead and answer yes or no on your screen. And then we'll close. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close. I'll share the results. Move this out of the way. Very similar. Uh, so 62% said yes and 38% said no, Ruth. <laughs> so we're getting essentially about the same breakdown all the way through. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, good. I think it's, you know, I, I, uh, someday probably what I should do is, is, is write or get, get, get together there with some friends and write some really bad case reports. Um, you know, I mean, I could, I could use some from what gets submitted to us and just change some of the details, but that doesn't seem respectful when people work hard to turn that in. Um, but I, I think it might be a useful thing to have an example of some, of some bad research questions or have some case reports where the study findings don't, don't answer the research question just in, as, as an example of some things what not to do. Um, and it's something because our profession is typically not formally trained in, with research skills um, that you know, as, as we just begin to dip our toe in this ocean, I think it's, you know, it's, not, it's not surprising that we'll see this with massage therapy papers. Um, it's part of the job of the foundation. It's part of our, our reason for being is to help our profession become more research literate. And so I'm just really thrilled that you're all here helping me accomplish this. All right, so let's go back to our discussion about the discussion section. So the next step is to suggest clinical relevance. How can your findings be applied? Um, and this is one where we need to um, we need to be a little bit careful about um, clinical applications, uh, but sometimes we need to be less careful than people think. So here's what I'm here's where I'm coming at. Um, it is inappropriate, for instance, to say because this case report found that massage does not seem to have an effect on fatigue for MS. Um, I, I, it, we don't necessarily have to um, assume that that means people with MS should not seek massage um, or should, not even that they shouldn't seek massage for fatigue. Um, that is not necessarily clinical, clinically applicable. But by contrast, we had another case report winner one year. I loved this case report. It was so cool. Um, her client, I believe this was a student case report winner, her client was a woman with dwarfism um, who was complaining that she had such tightness in her legs um, that she felt the circulation wasn't getting to her legs very well um, and so consequently her ability to walk very far without having to stop to rest was severely impaired. So we have got a functional goal um, but we have someone with a, a, a pretty rare condition. Most of us don't have a whole bunch of clients um, with dwarfism. Um, but what the therapist found on palpation, on working with this client, is that her fascia was just unbelievably fabulously tight. And um, 
you know, a lot of us do have uh, clients with really thick, dense, tight fascia. And that was the strategy that the therapist used in helping the client achieve her goal of being able to walk for a longer distance before having to stop for, to rest. Um, there's, a, there's a clinical application that, that is a little bit hidden. Because while, you know, while her concluding statement was massage made a difference for stamina in walking for this client with dwarfism, what she really found was massage made a difference for stamina in walking for people with tight fascia. Um, and so it would be completely appropriate to generalize the application of that case report to some other clients, even if they don't have dwarfism. So I, you know, I hope I haven't sort of talked myself around in a circle, but I want us to be aware that what is true for one person can be true for another person. Um, and we need to be willing to have our minds open to when that can happen. Um, so we have just a couple more steps in writing the discussion. We want to acknowledge strengths and weaknesses in the project. Always the weakness is going to be, you know, when you have an N of 1, you're only getting information for one person. Uh, but there might be some other weaknesses, for instance, in um, how you might choose to report a finding or um, you know, while your main research question was X, you got the biggest results under another, you know, about another topic or whatever. Um, but this is a place to acknowledge that and make suggestions for future studies. Um, and then lastly, we typically conclude with a takeaway message for the reader. So that's the discussion section. And um, I'll tell you truthfully, for me, I find that writing discussion sections or evaluating discussion sections, sec sections is, is, is fairly difficult um, for a few reasons. And so um, I'd like to ask a similar question of listeners about, you know, as you think about writing a discussion section about your, about your topic, what are some of the obstacles that you might perceive? Okay, great. So go ahead and answer. I don't know what the larger context is. I don't want to tell other massage therapists what to do. Or I don't know what is transferable to other clients. And while you vote, I was just wondering, Ruth, if that picture, that last picture, looked like uh, Dr. Boulanger there. I wonder if she's a yoga teacher instead. She looks quite flexible. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. And I'll share the results. Okay, a little bit different breakdown. So the biggest obstacle, we had 44% of the folks said, I don't know what the larger context is. 13%, I don't want to tell other massage therapists what to do. And 42% said, I don't know what is transferable to other clients. Go ahead. Interesting. So we okay. evidently, evidently we have most of our listeners perfectly willing to tell other massage therapists what to do, um, <laughs> which I think is absolutely wonderful. I mean, that's why we're here, is to help our colleagues. That's why we write case reports, is to help our colleagues make better um, choices for their clients. Um, and I'll have to say that I am absolutely with you on the first one. I have a hard time sort of fitting these things into the larger context um, or, or understanding where they fit in the context of other research. Um, and the, and the question about transferability can be, uh, it, it can be somewhat squishy. Um, so uh, uh, I'm with you on these challenges, and it's just one of those things that makes writing discussion sections most interesting. Um, so thank you for your input on that, for sure. Oh, and Brian, no, that wasn't Karen. It was uh, uh, in, the, in the previous picture. <laughs> it was um, something I got off of a free. Sure looked like her. Place. <laughs> So here are some more resources for you. If you would like to see some case report contest winners as examples of what we see in really great case reports, um, we publish them. <clears throat> we publish them in the International Journal of Therapeutic Massage and Body Work. That's IJTMB.org. Um, and so our case report contest winners are invited to publish. Uh, and um, when they choose to do that, they can go with any scientific journal. We, and we love for them to go with us because it's open sourced, which means anybody can access it. And we have a nice collection building there for you to see. Um, always you know, check in at the Foundation's website for information about the case report contest. We have uh, guidelines for how to write them that I, I think are really terrific. 
We have student and faculty resources. We have even a special section on writing the lit review. Um, that's been very useful to me. Um, and then lastly, there's a, a uh, in, in building, they're not yet live, is something that uh, Geraldine talked about last week, the case report repository um, at caseread3.org. This is a, a project put out by the uh, uh, Massage Therapy Association of British Columbia, where they will be collecting case reports of various levels of rigor. So they're going to have some sort of tiered um, in terms of, of how rigorous they were. Uh, and not just about massage, but I believe about all, uh, lots of different kinds of manual therapies. Um, so when that goes live, that's going to be a nice resource for everybody and something you can think about um, contributing to. So, so we have come now to the part where um, I can take some questions. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Ruth. So there will be a little um, reverberation you'll hear there in the background, so just please if you can disregard that. Um, I'm thankful that you mentioned that website again, the casere3.org. We had a couple folks email in this past week and tried to access it, and it's not live yet. It will be live soon. We don't have a specific date, so in case you're trying to access those case reports, just um, we ask for a little patience. Thank you. So Ruth, Greg is wondering, what types of parameters could one use to determine the literature review component to make sure that it's done, meaning you've done due <laughs> diligence? Um, it's my favorite answer. It depends. Um, what kind of parameters can you use? You know, Brian, there are so many, uh, Brian and uh, Greg, you said? Yes. There are uh, so many variables that might play into this. Um, you know, if you're doing a case report on a condition that has been extensively studied in the context of massage, um, you may just have to say, I am only going to read studies that are less than five years old. And, um, and I'm only going to read studies that pertain to the demographic of my client. Um, but if you're choosing something that's rarer or something that is where you need to look into what other professionals, you know, what other healthcare providers have done to help a client reach certain goals, um, you're going to have to be more broad-minded about that and you may also have to dip into some of the older literature. Mm -hmm. um, I think you say you're done when you think you're done. The more you include, the more credible your case report is. But you, uh, uh, at some point, you really do have to say, okay, now I'm going to stop. Um, okay. I think you know, in an average case report that we see coming in for the contest, a, a list of 15 to 30 resources is not unusual. And okay. some of those are uh, primary resources, and sometimes they are, you know, they they also uh, often include secondary resources, and that's fine. You just don't want them to be the majority of what you are using for your background information. I hope that answers your question. There's not a there's not a cut and dry answer to that. Okay, so it's interesting, Ruth, that you mentioned uh, timeliness and uh, looking at older studies. Jennifer writes in. Uh, she said, at this level of evolution of our profession, basically, um, shouldn't we want to repeat some of the studies that have already been done? in case one was a fluke, for instance, and, you know, to reinforce the results. Um, Jennifer, I think that's a great idea, and you're quite right that we are still really in the baby stages of building our evidence base. And with a case, by definition, with a case report, everything, you know, every instance is going to look a little bit different. Um, uh, it's uh, and, and consequently, I think, you know, for instance, if you were to look at that MS report, which I think did not go to publication, um, uh, it, it, but if you were to look at that and say, I want to try my massage for fatigue and MS and see if I get a different result, you know, having that case report in your, in your, uh, having the previous one in your mind and in your references as a, you know, as a, a comparison point can serve you well. If you're simply trying to repeat someone else's results without you know, sort of without trying to improve the quality of life for your client, um, 
then it's an exercise in futility. Well, but really, I want to bring this back um, to something Geraldine was saying yesterday. One of the things that makes a case report unique and, and something different from doing an experiment is it is, by definition, what we do for our clients. Mm -hmm. Very good. Anna is wondering, she says, when coming up with a research question, do you have to look for results about objective effects? I know you talked about functional goals. Uh, or can you test subjective effects, like clients' perception of pain or emotional state, et cetera? Right. I love that question. Um, and I have a couple of answers. You can do both. Um, Ten-point pain scales are acceptable as quantitative data. You know, mm -hmm. if it's the same client and the same 10 points every session, um, then you can report that as a numerical interpretation of a subjective experience, which is pain. Um, what some people will do is, is have a combination of those pains, for instance, a pain scale or a state or trait anxiety scale. Um, <clears throat> And then they may also include some client comments like, you know, I can't be, believe how well I slept last night, or mm. uh, I uh, was in a good mood when I expected to be cranky, or uh, my headache went away, um, and, it, you know, and it just gave me so much energy, or whatever. I mean, it's, it's completely appropriate to include your client's comments, but in, in, in case reports, you are on steadier ground if you choose a measurement tool that lets you use some numbers. Um, that, again, it doesn't preclude including you know, descriptions of your client's experiences. Um, and Karen will talk more next week about um, uh, ways to measure your results. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say, especially if you've never written a case report before, you really are going to have an easier time of managing all your information if you choose something that you can transfer into numbers. And again, it is completely legitimate to use a 10-point um, uh, uh, pain scale, for instance. And that, so that's fairly easy to do. OK, great. Now, Ruth, you referenced um, reports. Um, I'm looking for the word here. Uh, mentors. Mm -hmm. You had both stu uh, students, you know, with, with teacher mentors. Amanda gets stumped on some of the technical language of research reports. What would you recommend to her for help decoding that language? Um, thanks, Amanda. I'm going to promote two books. And I, uh, I happen to have them here on my desk because I always have them within hands reach. Um, and if you like, um, Brian, maybe you and I can arrange to get these titles and authors listed somewhere where people can. Absolutely, them absolutely. Later. Mm -hmm. All right. So one book um, is called Massage Therapy: Integrating Research and Practice, and it is edited by Trish Dryden and Chris Moyer. And it is a, uh, as it says, it's a book about integrating research into practice. And so there's some lovely chapters about research in general. Um, I'm, you can hear my, me flipping the pages, but then it has chapters for specific populations. For instance, pediatrics, pregnancy and labor, athletes, older adults, headache, neck and shoulder pain, and it goes on and on. Um, and in each of these, it overviews the, the current research. This book came out last year. So I think it came out in 2012. Just checking. Yes. Um, and so that's the, the, the access date. Um, and in the background information, you know, the leading up chapters about how to read research or how to make sense of, or how to interpret research, it's very, very friendly and, um, and I found extremely usable. So that's one resource. And then another resource is another book um, called Making Sense of Research. Um, and the author is Martha Menard, M -A, I'm sorry, M-E-N like Nancy, A-R-D like dog. Um, and it's in its second edition. Um, and uh, again, a very friendly author um, who really can help you, I mean, takes you step by step through reading a research paper and making some sense, evaluating it, deciding if it's, you know, relevant to you, deciding if it was a good research question. Um, you know, these are wonderful resources. Um, we are 
again, what we're hearing in these questions is that massage therapists are not yet getting trained in their core curriculum and research skills. It hasn't seemed necessary because we haven't had a deep base of evidence to refer to. So we were, you know, doing massage based on best guesses and, and trying to be conservative and helpful. Um, but it is, it is really time for us to change this and start building some of these concepts um, into core curriculum. In the meantime, you know, what will lead the way is you guys, is all of us together saying, yeah, this is now part of our job description. We need to be able to do this. Okay, great. Well, we're just about out of time. Let's take one more question because a couple of people had emailed in about this. And it uh, regards the number of clients or studies or person study, I should say, uh, for a case report. Can a case report be written on one session or should you see a client 10 times? What's the parameters there? Yeah, um, Gerilyn brought, they talked about this a tiny bit last week. Um, and, and theoretically, you know, if you get an absolutely miraculous, amazing turnaround in one session, you could write a case report on that. My opinion is it would be kind of hard, but possible. Um, but there's no hard and fast rules about this. In the case report contests, just so that everybody is sort of playing by the same, you know, on the same playing field, we, we mandate a, a minimum number of, uh, you know, at least six sessions. Um, but that was, you know, because that seemed reasonable, but not because it's some, some law about what needs to go into a case report. Um, it, there's no reason you couldn't write a case report about a, a, a single client that, you know, goes over months or longer. Um, but one thing that is true about case reports is, is that it, it is an N of one. We actually had a submission to our contest this year where it, it was two therapists working together who happened to share a client. Um, and so they both worked on the case report. And that was still fine because it was one client. Um, by contrast, if you have one therapist working on, you know, three or four clients who have carpal tunnel syndrome, um, they'd have to write three or four different case reports, you know, one for each client. And then you'd have what's called a case series. Uh, mm -hmm. But to write one report with all of those clients together, that's problematic. That's no longer a case report. Mm -hmm. Well, I said that was the last question, but uh, Rosemary emailed one in that's very specific Hi, to, to this webinar, so I'd like to answer that. And if you need to go, uh, folks that are attending, please, by all means, you can watch the recording. So Rosemary's question, do authors tend to overstate the impact of their findings in the discussion section? Is there any specific language that should be avoided? <laughs> This is a leading question. I know what she wants me to, I, I, at least I think I know what she, where she wants me to go with this. Um, yes, authors can have a tendency to overstate their findings. I mean, the, we're, we're, this is our um, tunnel vision, right? We, we want to think, if we've done our best to control the variables so that massage is really the only different intervention that happens during this period of time, um, that we can say categorically, Therefore, I conclude that massage had this effect on uh, blood glucose levels for this client. Um, <clears throat> uh, when in fact it might have been that, um, you know, some other major stressor or something changed in this client's life and that was a contributor as well. Um, the language that we use, I can say more about what language not to use than the language to use. Um, and, and this is something that I am extremely careful about. As a, as a writer, I, I, I treat language very, very carefully because, you know, used just a little bit wrong, things can go very, very badly indeed. And so one word we want to we want to really avoid, in, certainly in talking about case reports, but in talking about research in general, is proof. Okay? For something to be proven to be true, it needs to be true for everybody all the time. Mm -hmm. um, Consequently, we, we can't, I mean, for instance, it has never been proven that cigarette smoking causes lung cancer. What we can point to is that the evidence suggests that cigarette smoking is a contributing factor to lung cancer. And the statistical correlation is so great that, um, you know, that it has this kind of credibility. But to say we have proven that massage flushes toxins, there's some fighting words for you. Mm -hmm. um, a, that's not true. 
because um, the toxin question is 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 uh, has is wide open. We have not yet conducted research that demonstrates that. Um, and 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 B, we haven't proven anything when you say that one you know that a massage on one person makes this kind of difference. Um, so. Uh, and, and, and the reason I'm making a big point of this is that when people read research and they simplify it into terms that they like to, to take and share with other people, sometimes that word proven um, gets, uh, gets mingled into that conversation and then things go, things just run amok. Um, and so I want to encourage us to, to be careful about that word. And we can say research demonstrates or the evidence is strong about massage and anxiety, or massage and depression, mm -hmm. or um, y you know, and those kinds of terms. But to use the word proven basically demonstrates that you're someone who is um, not well educated about research, um, and so you look a lot smarter sometimes with your mouth closed than you do with your mouth open. <laughs> I've learned that the hard way. I just want to <laughs> say I've learned that the hard way. Evan, we all. <laughs> Well, Ruth, that was an excellent answer. A uh, very good point to understand for sure. So, thank you for clarifying that. And thank and you for Ruth. yeah, and, and thank you for an excellent webinar. Really, I'm so enjoying this series, and all the feedback we've been getting is so positive. Now, okay. quick, quick question for you, dear. If and this also regards the last webinar. If your question was not answered, is there a place to go? for folks that they can email you or Gerilyn, or is there a discussion page on the Massage Therapy Foundation website? What would you recommend? That's a great, that's a great point. We do not have a discussion page at the Foundation website at this, at this moment in time. But if you go to our website and go to Contact Us and say, you know, in your subject line, Case Report Webinar, then our staff will field those, and I'll just make sure that they send on the questions. We'll start with Gerilyn, and then Gerilyn, you can you can farm them out to wherever they go. Okay, perfect. So the website is massagetherapyfoundation.org. It's a really yeah. nice, really nice plug for the foundation website there. So please go and review it, even if you don't have a question. Just go check it out and all the amazing resources, especially that toolbar that Ruth referred to earlier. Well, Ruth, thank you again. That was fantastic. I'm Thank looking you, Brian. It was my pleasure. Yep, and I'm already looking forward to next week's in the, uh, oh, it's gonna in the be series. Awesome. <laughs> oh, great. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.